afternoon and thank you for coming. My name is Nicole Casper and I am the president of the Brockton Historical Society. And today is one of two talks that I will be giving at the Society this fall. The next will be on November 4th on the Spanish flu and the end of World War I in the Brockton area. Today's program was the idea of the, our late president, Jim Benson. Jim wanted to do more to promote the history of Brockton by having talks like this along with many displays at least once a month. As such, I decided to leave our August display on Ted Williams up. And this was done to recognize Ted Williams' 100th birthday, which was August 30th. And if you haven't had a chance to see, we've got some pictures that Stanley Bowman took when Ted Williams visited Brockton in the 1950s, along with a pair of Ted Williams shoes. So as I was preparing today's talk, stories of Hurricane Florence, predictions on its path, evacuation orders, photos of empty store shelves, dominated both the news cycle and social media. Today, the total effects of the storm are still being discovered as it moves inward and wreaks havoc with flooding rains. This coming Thursday, September 21st, marks the 80th anniversary of the hurricane of 1938 and remains, in New England at least, the storm by which all others are measured. And for many, there is a story of where they were, where their family members were during the storm, and how it affected them. For me, it is the story of my late grandmother, who was 20 years old and working as a sales clerk at Shepherd's Department Store in Providence, Rhode Island, the day of the storm. She had to walk four miles home to Cranston because the buses weren't running later that day and often told the stories of mannequins floating in the streets. When I became the director of archives at Stonehill College in 2001, on my second day of work, I was brought over to meet Stanley Bowman at his home on Breer Street. Stanley had promised to give his co collection of photographs to the college after he died. Now Stanley is a talk all on his own, as many of you probably know, but I'll just say that one of the first pictures he showed me as he brought me around was this one of the steeple of East Bridgewater Unitarian Church, which had been lifted up and sent back down through the roof. So when Jim Benson suggested the idea of giving a talk on the hurricane, I knew it would be a great way to highlight the 40 plus images Stanley took of the storm. And then I started my research and was surprised at what I found. I mean, I knew the about the hurricane and had read about it and had listened to my grandmother and grandfather talk about it. I'd read news articles and actually having worked at, in Providence at the State Archives in Rhode Island, I was actually on Westminster Street, not far from my, where my grandmother worked in 1938, which had flooded during the storm. But I found it hard to imagine not being aware of a massive and destructive hurricane speeding its way toward New England. But then again, in 1938, there was no TV, no satellite, no radar. Telephones and radios were present, but not in all homes. In addition, the US Weather Bureau, today's National Weather Service, was also very unreliable. In fact, hurricane warnings at this time were only three years old, and forecasters relied on telegraph information from ships and surface reports from inland areas. The hurricane of 1938 developed around September 10th in the eastern Atlantic near Cape Verde Islands. On September 16th, the captain of a Brazilian freighter sighted the storm northeast of Puerto Rico and radioed the U.S. Weather Bureau. It was expected to make landfall in South Florida, and South Floridians actually did begin to prepare for the storm. However, on September 19th, the storm changed direction and began to move parallel to the eastern seaboard. Charlie Pierce, a junior forecaster for the U.S. Weather Bureau, actually predicted that the storm would hit New England, but the chief forecaster at the time overruled him, believing, as most did, that since a, a storm of that size had not hit, this area, it wouldn't be, happen again, and the storm would veer out to sea. The morning of September 21st, the storm was reported to be 100 to 150 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, when it began to accelerate and move toward New England at 60 miles an hour. 
and it made landfall over Long Island at 2.30 p.m. Because of the speed was similar to that of a freight train, the hurricane of 1938 is sometimes referred to as the Long Island Express. So I titled this talk, The Hurricane of 1938, A Look Back at the Big Wind, because that's how it was referred to. And this just shows the path of the hurricane. The reason for the name of the talk comes from uh, the October 1st headline in the Brockton Enterprise. The reason for the big wind is because no one knew that a storm was coming. That day, the forecast had only called for overcast skies in Brockton, and no one was pre prepared for hurricane winds by 4 p.m. The gale, as it was described by the Brockton Enterprise on September 22nd, started in the afternoon and increased in intensity. It began to subside around 9 p.m., and by 10 p.m., the danger had passed, and it was virtually over by midnight. But those few hours wreaked havoc on the city and surrounding towns. Brockton High School faculty member Stephen Cote reported to the Enterprise that he estimated the winds to be about 80 miles an hour in intensity in the city. However, he could not check his wind gauge as it was too dangerous to go up to the roof of Brockton High School. The brunt of the Category 3 hurricane was felt by Long Island, Connecticut, the Rhode Island Shore, and Providence, New Bedford, and Cape Cod. The astronomical high tides due, the, due to the autumnal equinox caused, resulted in a storm surge cause, causing catastrophic damage and death. Also, the Blue Hills Observatory record, recorded the strongest wind gust of the storm at 186 miles an hour. By 9 p.m., 139 trees had been reported down in the city. Damage was reported in all parts of Brockton. In all, it's reported that over 600 lives were lost in total in New England due to the storm. Two of those fatalities were in Brockton. Here's the headlines the day after the storm. The first fatality was John Callan, a 30-year-old city employee who suffered a fractured skull when struck by a falling tree and died later at Brockton Hospital. Timothy Kelleher, 71, of Hotel Norris, died from a heart attack brought on by exhaustion from the storm. Twelve additional people were reported injured, and a third death would occur on September 23rd when Patrick Fay fell while chopping trees. As the storm intensified, calls for help were received, keeping departments very busy. One of the first calls received by the Brockton Fire Department was from Brockton Hospital. A short circuit and a transformer shot out sparks, creating fear of fire. Thankfully, no fire resulted, but Fire Chief Dickinson kept a crew at the hospital, first to ensure building safety, and then to provide portable lighting apparatus needed due to lack of power. Nurses were equipped with flashlights as they tended patients, and the larger flashlights of the firemen were used to provide light for minor surgeries. Now, this is the article about the second. This is actually not reported in the Enterprise. It's actually reported in the Boston Globe. I apologize for the quality of this picture. It doesn't show, but these nurses, Louise Dumas, Martha Kearney, Mary Cook, Gertrude Garvey, Antonia Bennars, and Ora Randall were equipped with candles as they attended patients. And this photo does show them holding candles. It just, I apologize, it doesn't show it very well. During the storm, the fire department reported to a variety of calls from fireboxes. An alarm from box 2514 at Belmont and Ash Streets sent the department to 287 Belmont Street, where the wind had blown down a chimney, which crashed through the roof. No one was hurt, but the debris barely missed Mrs. Edith Parker, a resident on the first floor. Live wires on North, North Warren Avenue sounded the alarm from box 3211 at North Warren Avenue, Milton Street, and officers Ring and Warren in a cruiser car were reported to have remained on the scene directing traffic. Firemen also went to the home of Charles Fisher, 
on Belmont Street, where part of the second floor was blown out by the storm, as seen in this photo. Here's another fo photo of looking out on the street from where the house, the corner of the house was blown away. There was also an alarm at box 5225 at Riverview and North Leiden Streets at 1 a.m. and firemen responding from Central, Campello, and East Side stations faced a hazardous run over wire and debris field streets for what would be reported as a false alarm as they never found the person who pulled it. But even as the storm passed, danger did not. For no electricity came the use of candles and lanterns. At 4.30 a.m., George Larsenos stumbled over debris while investigating damage to a large row of hen houses at the rear of his home at 710 Crescent Street and accidentally set fire to the structure when the lantern he was holding slipped from his hands and broke. Spreading quickly, he ba the spreading, spreading quickly Larsenos barely escaped the fire. By the time the fire department arrived, the structure of how hen houses 250 feet long and 50 feet wide was beyond saving. Fortunately, none of the 1,000 chickens usually quartered in the hen houses were harmed as they had already been turned out into the fields. Fallen trees caused the biggest issues, pulling down wires and blocking roads. On September 23rd, Robert Tilgren estimated over a thousand trees fell in Brockton during the storm. And on September 20, 22nd, one article read, Clearing Streets is a Job Nobly Done. You will notice the subheadline, Mayor Rowe acts to urge huge WPA Army to complete tasks. This was one of the first disasters where federal help was available as the New Deal had created a large federal workforce that could be deployed for recovery. In all, 2,400 ma male WPA workers were put to work along with city highway and forestry workers to clear the roads. This, the mayor also called the city council into session for an emergency $50,000 appropriation for expenses. And yes, that number is correct, 2,400 male. And it was very specifically specified male WPA workers in the article. Here is some of the damage um, that was recorded by Stanley Bowman. So Stanley Bowman at this time would have been 20 years old. He was working for the Brockton Enterprise um, as a photographer and copywriter. These are trees that fell on Ash Street. Two men atop a roof with debris from a fallen chimney. Down trees on Union Street. Some more downed trees. These trees were down at, the Wal at Walter Bird's house at 107 Pearl Street in Brockton. Avid Fortier and Clarence Eburn observe a tree that fell on and crushed an automobile. Here are two different pictures. I get, it looks like the tree had been cut away to clear the road, but then they were still trying to figure out how to get the tree off the car. Probably the largest damage to buildings was this one on Center Street, which was damaged about 6 p.m. when the roof caved in, damaging the 6th and 7th floors, um, which were luckily unoccupied. This was a former shoe factory known as the Little Building. It was named after people named Little. It had nothing to do with the play on words that it was a large building named Little. Um, and the debris from when this caved in was actually carried over and landed on Ward Street. Several barns and f houses, again, were damaged. Here's a barn that was damaged to the Leonard family. And these are Kenneth 8, Richard 11, Donald 9, and Edgar, all of 38 Rockland Street, who bemoan the loss of their barn, whose upper story was literally torn apart. Stanley was not beyond staging photographs and telling the children to look very, very sad. <laughs> and then there's just another photo with them pointing out the damage to the barn.
This is the steeple at North, uh, excuse me, at Warren Avenue Baptist Church, which barely um, missed hitting the pastor who happened to be walking by at the time that it crashed. David Hoxie of 369 North Montello Street, Brockton, and Harry Powell of 328 Manor Street of West Bridgewater, both of the F City Forestry Department, are shown here cutting limbs that fell on an automobile on Main Street opposite Allen Street. And here, observers taken the site of a downed tree that was crushed, that crushed automobiles at Lee Electric Service in Brockton. Damaged are cars owned by Edward Lynn of Raynham, Frederick Krauss of Brook Street, and Mrs. Mowry of Oakland Ave. And just some of how big these trees were. Another tree that uprooted a sidewalk. Some more down pine trees. And this recovery crew chopping a tree on Liberty Street included Ted Caffrey, Gregory Galvin, Stephen Willis, Sam Castano, Bernard Beggs, Al Williams, Dan McCarthy, and John Sullivan, who was the foreman, who all were part of the sewer department. This is Ash Street between Foreign Avenue and Gordon Street. And these are down trees on Bouvet Avenue. Brockton Edison had the big job of restoring power, for not only had trees taken down wi wires on, t um, on houses and buildings, but this, show this photo shows the damage to the poles as well. And while the photos are themselves incredible, so are the stories that were reported by the Brockton Enterprise. Old Elm lingers. Pops have been trying to get rid of the sickly old elm tree at our place for years. A few months ago, we inquired about how much it would cost to have it cut down and taken away, and they told us $50. Remember, this is 1938. That was a lot of money in 1938. <laughs> well, you should have seen Pop when the storm hit yesterday. He was standing in the window yelling at it. Go on, you darn old eyesore. I'm getting rid of you at last. We watched for hours, and two beautiful M's on both sides of it crashed. But that pesky thing never lost a limb. <laughs> Seeing is believing. A reporter climbing through fences and over wires in the inky darkness after writing columns of storm stuff remarked, Jeepers creepers, I'm beginning to believe the stuff I've been writing. <laughs> Guess fake news was a thing even then. <laughs> when it's gone, I never realized how, auto how many automatic motions I make. There were two candles in the house and both in the living room. I went into the bedroom and automatically pulled the light chain. And tree number 151. A tree went down about 6 p.m., half on our lawn and half in the street. I called the highway department and ordered cheerfully, please send, send some men up and have a fallen tree taken away. The man on the other end answered with freezing politeness, sorry ma'am, there are about 150 ahead of you. And then there were those who had the last laugh for not fully embracing the new technology. South Enders had been kidding ha Harry Brackener for years because he had refused to put electric lights into his drugstore at the corner of Market and Main Street. By Wednesday night during the storm, his store was alive with gas lights while the rest of the shop owners carried on with lanterns and candles. One woman reported she and her children needed clean clothes and she was behind in her ironing. Her electric iron, as she said, was about as useful as a muff in Africa, but her aunt across the street was a smart woman who had saved an old sad iron and therefore, the woman was able to do her ironing without a hitch, thanks to her aunt. Because God forbid, we didn't get those clothes ironed before we wore them. I lost my place. This is a barn that came down in South Hanson. So outside of the city, 
And this is a hen house also in Hanson that was destroyed. Hen houses really had it rough in the hurricane. This barn in Whitman was destroyed by the storm, reporting Mr. and Mrs. Hubbard of 223 Washington Street, Whit Whitman, estimated their loss at $3,000 as the wind destroyed this 85-year-old barn. But a cow and a calf were led just bef out just before it fell. And this barn in Whitman tipped over, or actually, I think the bottom half of it collapsed, and crushed these two cars. In addition to the electric electricity, 3,000 phones were out, and the toll lines were dead. Brockton Edison is reported to have winning the fight to restore light and power. Brockton Edison was reported knowing that no help would come from the outside, since Brockton was just one of a few, um, many com uh, communities that were affected. And this picture shows them trying to um, fix some broken down electric poles. So the last thing I want to talk about is, if I can find it, when I did this research, a lot of, um, oh, a lot of what I came, had came from the, um, the newspapers. As being 80 years old, a lot of people have died who are, who, have, who are around. Some people are still around, but they were very young when it happened. Um, and then I found a few weeks ago um, a diary upstairs in this house by, by a man um, named Raymond Whitney, Whitney. And Raymond was typical of somebody who would have kept diaries at that time. And I wanted to share with you what he wrote, because I think it really captures what a lot of people experienced and probably will give you a little bit better idea. So this is, these are quotes from his diary. Wednesday, September 21st, hot and rainy. Started to blow soon around noon and was a hurricane by 5.30. Bus was on time, but began to see trees down on Pleasant Street. A tree across the road stopped us. A second followed, so I started to walk. A third down behind me, and I, and I walked the three quarters of a mile home. Trees and branches down everywhere. I could scarcely stand against the wind. Soon after I got home, three sections of the piazza screen went. The garage door blew off. Lights went at 4.30, the telephone at 5. By 9 o'clock, the terrific roar was diminishing. And later, I saw a bus go by. The smell of green leaves filled the air also the smell of rotten wood. September 22nd, warm and fair. A sorry sight outside. Our trees are all set, but the ground is littered with branches. A big limb off the Doton's maple. Garden is flat. Elsie, who was his wife, drove me to work as buses are irregular. Scores of fallen trees on Pleasant Street. Hard to work today after the excitement of the storm. No light but candles. Austin came up. He just got lights on. Took us around the city. Bouvet Avenue's beautiful trees nearly all gone. Friday, September 23rd. Cloudy and cool. Can't work for the excitement. Elsie and I went down to the Cape on my afternoon off. Parked in Wareham and saw the railroad bridge wrecked by a tidal wave and also flooded stores. Saturday, September 24th. Fair and cool. Phone wire up again and service resumed. Hope had her hair cut and it looks very nice. I have no idea who Hope was. They had no children. Lots of kidding in the store on Matson's approaching, on Matson's approaching marriage, and a, which occurs a week from today. Harvey and Lauren, Lauren Smith start on vacation at Pocasset tonight if the National Guard will let them get down there. No news on whether they actually got to go on vacation or not. Sunday, fair and cool. Elsie and I walked down and got milk for breakfast. At 9.30, the electricity came on. I cl cleared the debris off the piazza and partially cleared the lawn. Then we washed the car. Monday, September 26, fair and warmer. I worked early and Elsie washed. 
seems good to be able to use the electric appliances again. Tuesday, September 27th, fair and warm. Worked early, stayed home tonight, and just rested. Thunder shower at closing time. Not so much talk of the hurricane now, but the threatened war of Germany and Czechoslovakia, and the rest is a big topic of conversation. So the approaching war in Germany, Neville Chamberlain had stopped negotiations with Hitler just about this time, and it quickly moved, at least in Brockton and some of the less devastated um, places, um, the storm off the front pages. And the last mention of the storm is actually in the diary on October 2nd, which was a Sunday, when they took a ride through Providence, Fall River, New Bedford, and Fairhaven. And this is what he reported. Didn't see much storm damage out of the ordinary, except for at Fairhaven, where two big yachts rested in the park by the bridge, and a lot more rested along the shore. And I want to share one other quick story um, that was from Fire Chief Dickinson in the, in the paper. So as the power went out, many people um, turned to candles. And where we would think, OK, you know, electricity was fairly new at this time. I mean, it was more common than, you know, it was probably in most houses in 1938. But you wouldn't think people would not know how to use candles. And so just so you don't think that people in 1938 were any smarter and didn't need the same common sense reminders we all do today, this is what he said in the paper. Urge care when, use can when using candles. Most people are unfamiliar with the use of candles, but they can start fires very easily. So he wanted to warn people that candles could start fires. The chief also warned residents to make sure, certain that their, the chimneys on their homes were in good working order before starting fires. He's quoted as saying, look first to make sure there is a chimney on the home before starting any heating, heating fires. I'm not sure if people just would start a fire and not have a chimney or just not, and he wanted them to actually go look at their roof and make sure their chimney hadn't fallen off since so many chimneys were knocked down during the fire. But it was just a great quote, and I figure since we're the generation that has caution hot on our coffee cups, I wanted you to realize that people have always needed those friendly reminders. <laughs> And so that is my very short talk on the hurricane of 38. It was much worse in places like um, Connecticut, which felt the eye, Westerly Rhode Island, which was devastated. And I think one building still has the high water mark. Most buildings were knocked down. Providence would suffer several more hurricanes in the 1950s before they would then build the hurricane barrier, which now closes and regulates the water on the, Pres the Providence River to avoid flooding of downtown, which was, was so devastating um, in Rhode Island. And one of the reasons I think it was so damaging is that it had been almost 100 years or about 100 years since the area had felt a hurricane. Um, and I kind of compare it to, we hadn't had a very bad storm, um, but we had one this last March. And when you think about it, I was at work, I came, went home and then took the long way home from Easton to Attleboro because so many tr roads were blocked because of trees. And when you think about them not knowing a storm was coming, we didn't realize how bad that storm was going to be. Many people were without power for a lot of time, so you just never know what kind of storm would hit. Um, but the hurricane of 38, remains the granddaddy of all storms, the one we all compare no matter what storm, the hurricane of 38 comes out. So on this Thursday, as we hit the, the anniversary and we continue to watch the recovery efforts down in North Carolina, um, we can think about all the people who had to recover um, from the hurricane of 38. I was amazed they were required to go to work the next day, and even without power. Today, we would be at home for a couple days, couple weeks before power was restored. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Before I take questions, I just want to share our next talk will be on October 4th at 2.30, and I'm going to be doing a talk about the Spanish flu in Brockton and the end of World War I. So 100 years ago, the Spanish flu um, hit Brockton relating to a medical crisis, and um, also a month later, the armistice um, and the end of World War I happened. So I just want to, I have a talk that I'll be doing on that. That will not include Stanley Bowman photos since he was not born then. So. <laughs> Actually, I think he had just been born. He was born in 1918, so. 
Questions? Was there flooding, much flooding here in the area? No, most of the damage was, was the trees, the, the tree damage. It did rain hard, but it did not have the really, um, there's no real reports of flooding, which is surprising considering Bro Brockton floods in regular rainstorms. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the, I feel, and not being a, a Brocktonian, you all can correct me, a lot of the development of Brockton in the 1960s and a lot of the paving, I think, has created a lot more issues with flooding. And so some, a lot of the flooding that we see today um, or we're seeing in the 60s um, is part of a lot of the development. But it didn't get the amount of rain. And even the storm itself, the flooding that was felt by the coastal the communities, it was all the tidal wave. It was the storm surge that actually caused the flooding. It wasn't rain that caused the flooding. It was that massive storm surge that came through and just devastated those coastal towns, killing hundreds of people. I have a story similar to yours, but your grandmother, my great great grandmother, uh, worked in downtown Providence also. And when the water started rising, she was too late to leave, and she climbed upon a car. And when the water came above the car, she climbed the telephone pole next to the car. Because I guess they had those little spiky things yep. on the telephone mm -hmm. poles back then. And they plucked her off a telephone pole to save her. Yeah. Providence was very devastated um, by the water, right? Yes. It came right through downtown Providence. So if you're familiar with downtown Providence, where um, my grandmother worked, which is Shepherd's Department Store, if you're familiar with that, it's on Westminster Street. It's not far from City Hall, but basically the river has actually moved. So um, the, mo the river moved it, was moved for Providence Place Mall in the 1990s. But basically the pro coming up the Providence River, the tidal surge just flooded the entire downtown area. Um, and again, the hurricane barrier was, if you're not familiar with, they built a, hur they call it the hurricane barrier. It was built in the 1960s after those, um, the devastating hurricanes of the 1950s, Donna, Carol, Hurricane of 54. Mm -hmm. I think boats were pushed all the way up the Taunton River, up mm -hmm. to the Weir and Taunton. Yeah. Because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had, it had quite the effect. And, you know, boats were lost, like, you know, the damage, I think you brought the book. There's, uh, or, no, somebody, you have the book. There was a book published of all the different pictures, including some of Stanley Bowman's, but all the pictures in Long Island, Connecticut, Worcester, on the Cape, of like railroads and bridges like just twisted around and stuff. The, the damage that the wind and the water caused was just astronomical. Um, and as I said, it went right, basically right up through Long Island and right up through Connecticut. Um, but it was the tidal surge that caused, and luckily Brockton was far enough inland. And it was a very quick storm. So where North Carolina has been having the storm since Thursday night, um, this storm hit Brockton just about noon as the, it was recorded, but it really hit its height at, starting at 4.30. But it was over pretty much by 10 and gone by you know, midnight. So it was pretty much a nine hour storm or so. Yes? My story isn't exciting, but this shows our lack of understanding time. I was in the fifth grade, and my best friend and I were at the what used to be the Alice Brett School, which is off of Pleasant Street here on the west side. And we stayed after school to clean the chalkboards and clap the erasers and all that good stuff. And we walked home. We lived nine tenths of a mile away. We walked home, and there was a terrible wind, and we got a little bit of fun. And all, we got to the corner of our street, Tilton Avenue, which is from here, and there was a lady waiting for the bus, and her umbrella blew inside out. And we thought that was so funny. You know, we went on home in our innocence and watched the trees in our yards fall down. I had no clue. Our parents had no clue what was going on until, you know, we began to find out the next day in the newspaper how bad it had been. But compared to today, when they're telling you, you know, Constantly, yeah. we can advance. And that's why I called it the big wind, because to you it was a big wind, right? Yeah. It was just a big yeah. windstorm. And even our fifth grade teacher teaches didn't often have automobiles in those days. 
she walked down to the corner of Legion Parkway to take a bus home, and she knew the policeman on duty. And I don't know whether it's still there or not, but they used to be uh, some hot there. What is it that measures the pressure? The barometer. The barometer, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, the policeman said, look, Ms. McCartney, this isn't working right. It's showing the barometer way, way down. She told us that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of it continues to be in today's, you know, memory and the Lord because it was no one knew, you know, the devastation. It was, the devastation was astronomical, especially again on the South Coast. But here, it was like, oh my God, we got hit by this huge hurricane. But I was at work and I was walking home and just didn't know. And again, like today, we would have had school called off 36 hours in advance before it arrived, and um, you know. And but you just never know. And um, but luckily, people like Stanley and you know the newspapers recorded it, and we were able to to remember the different stories and and just remember that candles can start fires. <laughs> I just, that in the chimney one, I just thought was the greatest, you know, you know, it's just, look up and make sure you have a chimney before you light a fire, okay? Because what happened was, a lot of people at that time, by then, had switched over to electric appliances and had gotten rid of their wood-burning stoves or the different stoves. One person was recalled to have pulled out a, a gas plate out of their cellar. So I think people were pulling things out that they hadn't used in years and they were not probably using them correctly. So, any other questions or stories that your families or you have? So, well, thank you all for coming. I hope you'll join me on October 4th. Oh, November 4th, I'm sorry, November 4th. It was supposed to be in October, and we've changed the date. So it was originally October 21st. We've changed it to November 4th, not complete with the Patriots game. November 21st. The Patriots are not playing till 8 p.m. that night, so you have no excuse. It's the day of the time change. Oh, the time change. Well, I can only do so much. <laughs> so I hope you also, our displays are very new, so. Um, the new Rocky display, so if you haven't had a chance to walk around and see our new displays, I also welcome you to do that. So. And thank you so much for coming. Thanks.